great having you here. Thanks for joining. My pleasure. I am so happy to be here with you, Joe. <laughs> okay, so everyone, please meet Natira McDermott. Um, she is a professional, well, a coach, professionally working with helping female entrepreneurs and or female professionals of all kinds, and you will tell us more about that, to overcome stage fright and to embrace public speaking. But um, yeah, enough said from me. Please share with us a little bit about what you currently do, why you're so passionate about the work that you do, and it shows very much that you're passionate about it, and that's really beautiful to, to absorb. Um, and yeah, and, and then maybe later, if we could talk a little bit about the journey that took you there. I, I coach women on being more themselves when they're in front of an audience. So that will be dropping their perfectionism, their, um, some of that, those, that anxiety that happens when we get in front of a group of people and feel very scrutinized. I help them be more themselves and more and really tap into their authenticity because that's what I found is really, uh, that's what's most compelling for me when I talk to someone, if they're, you know, giving a talk or I'm talking, you know, one-on-one -on -one with them, it's when they're really themselves and I feel them there mm -hmm. that, um, that I really like them and want to listen to them. And then authenticity, I've tried working on that for myself. And sometimes it's hard to grasp. What is it? How can I dig it up? Um, <laughs> how, how can I tell that other people can see it in me? Like, how can you yeah, know. Your it's, own it's, a, it's a buzzword for sure, authenticity. And I think it's worth the work of figuring out what it is for you. I know for me, it, I went through most of my life without having really any idea of who I am and what I wanted and what I liked and all of that kind of stuff. And it's authenticity is about tapping into really what makes me tick, what I'm interested in, what I love to do, who I am so that, so here's, here's an example, actually imagine me in front of a group of people and I seem like a completely different person because I am taking on this role of being in front of a group of people. And then you compare me to being next, you know, with you having a cocktail in a living room and mm -hmm. I'm completely different. And oh. so what, what I try to do is to help people be more like, you know, themselves in the living room when they're in front of people when they're in that scary environment but it's and 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 not necessarily so informal that it's not appropriate but to be kind of hold on to that um that quality that makes them them we basically establish a comfort zone on stage is that what you do a confidence a com comfort zone a comfort zone yeah exactly so that exactly you feel you're safe on stage yeah. And that, and, and even, and it, you can take it off stage, you can put it on to, into a Zoom situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. And actually, the, the, the goal of actually just feeling like you're in the room right here and you're not, not locked up in your head trying to do something and trying to seem a certain way. Mm. And it's a challenge. And I, I, honestly, it's something that is, I think, an ongoing challenge is to, to get to and I think we just get better and better at it if we work but we're not, I, I haven't met anyone who is you know perfect Brilliant. yeah yeah oh that's interesting to hear and important to underline to let go of the perfectionism because we are like as humans we tend maybe females especially or as women we tend to measure us by comparing to others not seeing that others have had like years of practice and experience in what we are just about to dig into and engage in. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm very familiar with perfectionism. I never used to identify as a perfectionist. I think I just didn't like the word, mm -hmm. but I have realized that I have 
a tremendous amount of focus on succeeding or failing. And I have this, this measure and I realize that this is it's like not even a fair scale it's a there's the chance of success and then the alternative is total and utter failure and and it's almost like the the window for success is very small it's very very you know not there's not a lot of room for that but most of it is the the downside and so I've realizing that I'm like okay you know what I need to actually redefine what success is for me because that version of success, that whole measuring thing is not working for me anymore. Mm. I'm too old for it. <laughs> you look then old. <laughs> you look old enough to have such a realization. Uh, I hear you and I think I'm coming close to the same. It's also like perfectionism. Like I, I've, I, I think I have a similar experience on not being aware or thought that what is perfectionism? I'm not perfect myself. So how can I even call myself a perfectionist? And yet also having <laughs> having having to like strive for something, having goals, and then like not believing that I can even come, get anything anywhere near. But and still when I, I love, love, so I, that, love you know, that, I love that you said I love that you said I'm not enough, I'm not perfect enough to be a perfectionist. <laughs> That's <laughs> so good. That's a funny phrase, yeah. Um, but then I got like when it's finally clicked what it means to be obsessed about it, it has to be perfect before you even start sharing. It doesn't make sense. It does not make sense because there's so much to offer and to share and to talk about, um, like for presentation, for speech, whatever. And there's a demand. We've been called for giving presentations and and hire it and then why not just go out there and so what what is i mean we know where it comes from is like this famous fight or flight mode in our brain so what are what are well, sorry. you know let me just say one thing which is that i think it's very convenient to be a perfectionist and to avoid putting yourself at risk because you're lazy now like i <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like a very good excuse. Believe me, yeah, I've yeah. done it like crazy. And it's that, you know what? I'm going to wait until I'm better at this before mm -hmm. doing it. I'm going to wait until I X, Y, Z. And those things are just, so it, I like this framework of thinking rather than, um, you know, making these, these, you know, think about long-term, like oh, always be thinking in terms of what can I do in a week or mm -hmm. in two weeks, like thinking of little leaps that you can make that actually get you out into your uncomfortable zone. And that, and I actually did an exercise of this. I don't know if you were, you were, saw this. I realized it was last year and I realized that one of the things that I was completely nervous about was doing a Facebook live. The idea was horrible to me. And I had this image of people rolling their eyes, like people that I've worked with in the past before or whomever, because it's Facebook. So, you know, anyone can see it. And I imagined this and I thought that would be the most horrible thing, but it's it's close. There's something about it that's about my own visibility and my own, um, you know, bravery that I wanted to do it. And so I did these different little like little snippets of Facebook lives just to kind of go, you know what, I'm doing something uncomfortable and this is uncomfortable. And um, and I have to say, I was like supremely proud of myself for doing it. Mm -hmm. and I remember that. Do you remember? I saw, yeah, I, saw I mean, a few of those. They were just, it was about, it, and for me, it was the act of acting, you know? Mm -hmm. So is that then still authentic? I'm just pulling your, maybe a leg or not, but I'm just, is is it if you say you produce a, is it, but is that a, a healthy approach towards authenticity to fake it? until we make it. I think that's the, that's the thing, right? So you, because you mentioned you acted. In, acted, acted as in. Oh, as action. in taking action. Okay, sorry. Taking action. 
but I, I am I I do years ago I was because just to, some backstory here like I have always been as a kid I was always just just dreaded public speaking I dreaded it and I would try to worm out of any situation that required it so in high school, I had to do a big, there was a big debate when I was at like 17, I was supposed to do this debate. I was like asking my mother for a, like some kind of poison that would take me out of the, the, like could just make inca incapacitate me for 24 yeah. hours. So I couldn't do it. And, and then also in, as like when I worked in, in, an, at, at an ad agency, I would get asked to speak or stand up in front of, you know, different agencies and talk. And I would always try to find someone else to do it for me because I was like, I just, I can't do this. And so I am very much aware of, of the nerves and the judgment of what it, of what it feels like to be, to be out of your comfort zone. So I am, I'm especially sensitive to that. And I think that in some ways that makes me very good as a coach because I do, I do get it. And I've, and I have studied like what, what works for me and what, what has helped me do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds highly reasonable. And it also answers the, the other question to what led you to, to doing that kind of work today it's because you have experienced it yourself and you want, you learned how to overcome and find your way. And now you're sharing. So yeah, so is this, or were there other um, occurrences in your trajectory, in your career development, in the different um, positions you were holding that, like, when did it click to you, I want to be a coach, I want, want to help others to, to get through this? I was, I was, so I worked at an ad agency in, in city, and I worked in new business, so I would help the executives pitch for new clients so i would coach them in their like you know their strategy director creative director account director and and help them get themselves into shape to go and present some ideas to clients and try to win the business and i i i really liked that the challenge was that i just did not care about advertising at all and that felt like the big i i felt fraud, like a fraud for that. Like, I kind of didn't want to acknowledge, I just, I just don't care about, about this, um, this business that we're in. But, um, and there was one, but I did like the coaching. I loved that. I loved helping people be really good. And, and, and it was partly helping people be, be more likable in front of a client, because sometimes people will come into a room and kind of be just um overly confident and off-putting so actually helping them with that there was one there was one situation where i was in a room i was in a like a leadership meeting and this a woman in the group was being asked some different questions and i was watching her and i watched her basically undermine herself like moment after moment after moment. And afterwards, I, I went up to her and just said, I think that you can rise to, like the people in this room are looking to you to lead them and I can hear it and you can actually step up to that. And rather than be so deferential. And it was an interesting moment because she, she wasn't my client at all. Like she was just a woman there who I just could see was doing that thing that a lot of people will do, which is not stepping up, not taking, not, you know, mm. kind of waiting to be told you can run this thing. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I can, I, I think I've been in similar situations where there's somebody taking up all the, the energy but also the space in the room and the, the speaking time and you could see others sitting on there or yeah on the edge of their the chair <clears throat> wanting to say something but not daring to because there was so much noise already yeah yeah uh -huh. and 
one of the things that I was, I coached one woman, like, so when I did actually go and so I started being a coach, I got out of advertising altogether and started being a coach and working with different. And one of my first clients was someone who just always, when she was in a meeting, would always sit the back in the back corner. She would take notes. She would be very, very diligent about everything and was excellent, but just didn't, didn't feel comfortable, like actually speaking her opinion. Mm. And wow. yeah, I know. And it was really, it was really cool to watch her transform and suddenly, and, and through the thing of actually just breaking through that barrier of becoming much more confident so that she was able to speak and, 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 and actually, this is the interesting thing too, is that when, because she was um, afraid of really speaking up, it's almost like she didn't have any opinions, like the opinions were getting buried inside, like she wasn't really even aware of them. Mm -hmm. And then as her fear lessened her opinions and and points of view got much more apparent and she found herself like actually really you know speaking up much more and with less of a uh, yeah like with less of a a worry or question about how does she feel about this oh it's a like sounds like a big breakthrough and so, and and you witnessed that yeah like it happened in, like in one day and or in, in that situation in the room like wow okay that's big um and then like how long after these experiences did you take coaching um lessons or no what is it like getting like did you take a coaching certificate or um oh, basically in other words when did the transition happen for you When did you then decide I can do this professionally? I decided that I could do this professionally right away. And that was a decision that was based on the years of coaching executives in that corporate mm -hmm. environment. And um, so I just, I started working with clients outside of the office. So and you had the methodology already in place. It I, was just I didn't have methodology. I had a an approach. I had a, I had an approach, uh -huh. but it was very much of a um, how would I say it? Like homegrown versus you know I didn't get a certificate uh, for for it. Or in other words, authentic, like an authentic <laughs> approach. <laughs> No, but I, in since I have done, I have trained and um, one of the coaches that I've trained with is um, actually based in San Francisco, Tara Moore. And she, that was, that was a great training in terms of um, working with clients and actually less about how they show up and how they present themselves, but more on helping clients kind of see themselves more clearly with the messaging or Just who they are who who they are and what's like what you said earlier about you know how do i find my authenticity mm -hmm. that that kind of um inquiry into into yourself like that's what i learned through that coaching was was how to support someone with that work Uh, I bet it's not possible to just give a short answer to how that's done, but can you can you share some? <laughs> Apparently, it's a whole process you have to go through. <laughs> but um, but is there some some of the kind of construction sites that you can point towards um, where the work needs to be done? Like, is it mindset? Is it clothing? Is it going back to the childhood experiences to overcome whatever? Blockades or there are some exercises that you can do that help you define more about what you care about and what you value. And I think that's a really good mm -hmm. starting point is like if I asked you, what do you value? Like what are your or what are two or three characteristics about you that you love the most? 
Doing yeah. That. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And that sometimes we just feel that. Like I've in the past, like really into my 30s, I've felt strongly about situations and also justice. But it took some time until I could actually get hold of that as being part of me and that's and and treasuring that also and seeing it as an asset to me as a person so that's the kind of work that's yeah where somebody else can help me in this case of where, where what where i could have reached where i'm now much quicker and earlier in my lifetime yeah what one thing that is interesting, and this was um, research, I think I can't remember the, who, who did the research, but it was that one thing that is really effective for having someone be more comfortable in a challenging situation. So that could be on a stage, it could be in, you know, giving a presentation or a talk that one of the things that is really, really effective is for them, for that person to really understand who they are and what they value and be grounded in that knowledge. So, mm -hmm. and one of the ways is to get there is that defining of what is like, what is a peak experience from my life that I really, that made me the most energized, alive, you know, filled with that kind of life force feeling what was a time like that and understanding what what it, what did it feel like and be so aware of that 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 does just kn knowing that in your bones helps you when you go out in front of the, in the, in that kind of challenging situation mm. so wow I see myself on stage in several situations in the past and try and remember how I felt when well, suddenly nervous. And in some instances, I felt more comfortable and was easier. In others, it was more difficult. Um, what do you think yeah. was the difference between those? Well, I, I think the groundedness in myself, I think it's also important to understand and um, bring bring to to the forefront, like, why am I here? What do these people want from me? What can I offer? Like, I actually do have something to offer, like not to get drifted away with mm -hmm. who am I, you know? Um, but also, yeah, and, and I think, I see now also what you say, like how authenticity comes into play. If I, well, I, I think it's a orchestrate of, struggling with a stage fright itself which is a fight or flight um reflex but then also knowing who we are who i am in this case and yeah that that there's a spot to be filled and that there are people wanting to hear from me and right all of that and not only for the topic but also for the personality parts Exactly. Which help also in like as humans, as social animals kind of thing. It's it help like the personality helps to communicate, to get the message across, whatever the message is. Mm -hmm. Right. And one one thing that is I think really important is acknowledging what the value is of speaking to other people and versus giving them a paper to read or an, you know, sending like giving them an essay or a um, an email or like a written piece of document that standing up and, and speak or just speaking with someone else. It's really about connecting with them mm -hmm. as you, you know, human to human and, um, like telling a story, share, sharing a message, but actually that connection point. And, um, and one of the, like, there are two things that audiences are mo like judge a speaker based on. And one is their trustworthiness. So do I trust this person? Can this trust person like hurt me or seems, um, you know, shifty or dangerous. And then the other one is their competence. So do they know what they're talking about? But far and away, the biggest part is that the thing is the trustworthiness and that and in order to be a trustworthy person and to come across that way, we have to have an element of personal power of like actually 
believing in ourselves and feeling like and feeling that kind of confidence, which sometimes, yeah, you kind of have to like play it up a bit to in order in your own head to be able to be there. Because if you can get in front of an audience and be open, almost vulnerable, but open in the sense of I'm not blocked, I'm not closed down being so bold and consumed with what I've got in my head and the message that I'm about to share. In, in your coachings, there's not necessarily, um, or there's no necessity to go into the topics. It's more on the, or are you also working with your clients sometimes on the messaging and then it's the client's job to get the messaging right and you coach them towards fine tuning it? So that they I, usually, can... I usually coach them to express their ideas as clearly as possible mm -hmm. and to be as human as possible while they're doing it. That's, oh, yeah. that, that's really what I do. And I think a lot of people in, um, you know, in executive functions, probably in academia also, mm -hmm. I'm not as familiar, but that it can people can get very much locked into the subject matter mm -hmm. and the the facts of it and less in the in that in that interface that happens with an audience with it with when you're talking about it and how to how to boil it down and bring it into real real words and a real um a real connection there right Yeah, I, I think that's certainly true also for researchers and to yeah, to be focused on the topic, to be super nervous about, oh, no, I have to present. And is this even enough to present? What will be, like, people judge me for how little I found after five years of research? Like, what? <laughs> and then getting the personality aspects right. So through your coaching there's a lot of focus on appearance and um, authenticity on the self the persona of the presenter and how would then how would the focus at what point can the focus go back to the topic because i mean for the audience it's clear that subconsciously the audience would consume both i mean they're there for the topic but they get it through the messenger Like the exactly. presenter so therefore it's so important but now for the presenter with all the nervousness and and stage fright and oh no i have to focus on on how i come across not for the topic but me <laughs> as a person and then how am i how like where's the headspace that's remaining oh, for the actual i know, topic I know. well and you can you can see sometimes when when someone is really nervous about something and they just speak really, really quickly to kind of get it over with. Mm -hmm. And, and even, uh, you know, not, and that's, that's something that's very, a very simple, straightforward fix of slowing down, of slowing down and picturing what you're saying so that you're actually, you're, you're there with your audience in the discussion that you're having and mm -hmm. you're taking them through the content of your study, but you're doing it while you're actually kind of imagining it also. So you're experiencing it and you're getting a connection with them in that way. So it all melts into one thing. So there's no worry about losing one or the other. Once there's enough practice on the topic and also like in, in research, of course, we know that presentations have to be prepared. You want to practice, um, rehearse um, to get the content right and straightforward and no, yeah, no interruptions or, or what's the word? Um, uh, in German, we say blackout. We have a blackout, but to oh, freeze. Yeah, yeah. Freeze. no freezing. Freeze. Freezes. Uh, freeze. <laughs> Um, it's a horrible, horrible thing. <laughs> it happened to me once. Like, don't remind me. But also, life went on. I wouldn't have thought seriously when I was freezing on stage. For it was less than a minute, well, a couple of seconds, probably. I don't know how long. I mean, I was like, oh my god, I need to die. Like, no. 
and then life just went on like that's okay that's weird but and then at some point it was okay <laughs> so like it's really not so bad we're not gonna the world is not gonna end because of that <laughs> no it's not um yeah, so, yeah. I think the, the, the one one motto I have is lower the bar like um you know like the bar of performance of like lowering it and and just and then being able to leap over it if you get to that point but mm -hmm. but yeah not expecting perfection but expecting showing up like preparation but then being present mm -hmm. when when you're doing it I, lo I love also what you said in the in the beginning that yeah letting go of the imperfection uh, of the of the perfectionism daring to be imperfect in presenting in our case and then uh, a common recommendation for presentations and prepping for those is to just watch some TED talks and see how they do it. Like seriously, and they are like, normally they're super polished, but also not perfect. And I was just thinking, what if you tell someone, watch a TED talk and look for the things that are not perfect. And where you would think like, oh, I, would, I wouldn't have thought that this is possible in a TED talk kind of situation. Are what, is another challenge that some of your research scientists that you work with, what is what is a challenge that you see them them facing? The same as others, really. And I think the key is really let it let go of the perfectionism. Um, see how others do it, see that also others, also like senior professors are not perfect. They're not meant to be perfect because perfectionism is not approachable. It comes across as not fake, but artificial. And exactly. Exactly. We want to be approachable. So. And and I think the the goal rather than kind of perfect, the goal can be the most yourself and the most the most feeling like yourself and the most comfortable that you can be. Um, but the first the first part of this is just doing things like actually starting to show up and starting to speak up starting to just express yourself more and and then it's like after that after you get that muscle working the eventually getting to the point of going how do i make this better like how do i how do how do i actually connect more with my audience how do i and, and I think it requires curiosity on, on, on our parts of like, how do I, how do I do this? Because it's incredibly personal, right? Like what feels good for me as a presenter and as an audience is totally different than other people, but what works for me to make myself show up and feel more myself and feel also so much more engaged with the message that I have and the topic and the audience and how and what works exactly yeah i think that's also a perfect closing remark um and i've i've learned a lot i actually had like uh, five or so eureka moments in our conversation like new views on how the interplay between like focusing on the technical bits of preparing a presentation and and speech um, versus working on your appearance, your self, your courage, um, and all of that. So, can we just jump into this last bit of the conversation? Because I, I wanted to make that point, but you can also tell me if it didn't, really wasn't a point. And the point I wanted to make is, so when it comes to TED Talks, it's usually, they are usually referred to as great presentation styles and i think for tedx the one in canada toronto wherever like the main stage and they actually do i don't know how intense their training is but it's it looks so polished <laughs> and um and it's a nice reference point because you can actually learn quite a bit from just watching these but what i'm now learning from our conversation here is to how about we instead focus on what's not perfect, even in TED Talks, because they are still like they still have this authentic bit. The speakers are, I think, encouraged to remain themselves and not to 
I mean, the dad way of saying things is looks a little bit mainstream. Is it mainstream? Yeah. And still, many speakers still come across as, as highly authentic. If... I would say that it's more intriguing to me to watch a TED talk and look for when I really feel that person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's as yeah, I mean, looking for the flaw, like the looking for the flaw, I think on just it feeds into that machine of what's wrong with the situation. What's wrong? with Yeah, this no, this is I just wanted to 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 highlight there's an opportunity as a stepping stone towards that authenticity, but just to, just to realize there is no imperfection anywhere. No, there is imperfection everywhere and no perfectionism anywhere, even on these big, big stages, even by like senior, senior, double doctor, people, professors. Um, but yeah, the way you express this, so like letting go of the perfectionism, seeing that there's a lot of imperfection all around us and embracing that towards this is what connect what allows us to connect with each other and yeah not to see imperfectionism as a flaw but rather as humane and normal and yeah so why are we so obsessed and scared to have to polish everything to highly shiny objects exactly exactly we don't yeah okay so let's close up on that uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today in, in this episode. I hope you'll be back sometime soon whenever um, there's plenty more to talk about when it comes to presenting in, for us in a research context or in an academic context, but also bridging towards other sectors of society. There is plenty of opportunities where people share their thoughts, ideas, learnings, knowledge, um, inspirations and thank you for being such an inspiration for us today thank you joe it was a total pleasure <laughs>